Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand, and I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A court of wheat for denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and the wine. When he opened the fourth seal I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying come and see so I looked and behold a pale horse and the name of him who sat on it was death and Hades followed him with him and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword hunger death and by the beasts of the earth oh heavenly father as we just begin to open up lord revelation to what is coming lord in the future lord please show us lord what what we need to be expecting lord not us personally but lord that this world has coming in its future however soon near whenever that is that we as believers living in this age God can live with an expectancy God and warn people and tell them God people have no clue what is coming or so many people have never even read this and don't know anything they know something is up but Lord we have details given to us uh, they're just so that we may know the days and the times we're living in and be urgently warning others father so speak to our hearts lord and show us wondrous things through your word in jesus name amen so chapter six begins with a revelation of the things that the bible describes as coming upon this earth just prior to the lord's return it is a judgment upon the whole earth as we saw in previous chapters the church had been taken out before this and is seen there around the throne of god this judgment here comes from God himself, specifically from Jesus Christ, the Lamb who was slain. If you look at verse 16 of chapter 6, it says, And I said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? And so one of the more convincing arguments for a pre-tribulation rapture as it will be known at the time of this judgment that's going to take place that this is coming directly from God. This is coming actually from Jesus, from the Lamb. I can't imagine the Lord pouring out his wrath upon his earthly bride that he loves and cherishes. But this judgment, while severe, is God's final attempt to bring a planet that's in rebellion to him to repentance. So it's actually quite merciful. Because as you see in this chapter, when these seals begin to be opened, is when all humanity here on earth, there in verse 15, the kings of the earth, great men, rich men, commanders, mighty men, every slave, every free man, hid themselves, saying to the mountains and the rocks, verse 16, fall on us, from the wrath of the Lamb. All people's eyes are open to the fact that this judgment is coming from God. People are going to know at that time that this is, uh, this is God's judgment, yet many will continue to rebel directly in His face. Many will shake their fist at God, even in the face of His judgment that, you know, people say, oh, that's mean. No, it's pretty merciful. <laughs> and He's just appealing to people. So while chapter 6 begins with the opening of these seals, there are other events that will be taking place on the earth while these seals are being opened. I will point those out as we go along, but the opening of these seals are revealing the beginning of this uh, judgment by God that is going to come on the earth known as the Day of the Lord. 
It's also known as the time of Jacob's trouble in Jeremiah 30. Also as the 70th week of Daniel, Daniel 9, the indignation, Isaiah 26, Daniel 11. There's many other names given to this coming judgment in the Old Testament. The most common name and, a, and a most, uh, that most people know is the tribulation, the great tribulation or the seven year tribulation. In chapter 5, the apostle John, having been taken into a vision scene of heaven, he described this scroll that we saw last time represents a title deed for the earth. The crucified Lord Jesus was recognized as the only one worthy to open this scroll and redeem fallen humanity. And we went over all the symbolism involved in that chapter, saw how from the throne of God itself came a lamb as though having been slain, who took the scroll according to chapter 5 verse 7. Now in verse six, or chapter 6, verse 1, I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals on this scroll. And so by opening one of the seals, that would allow a portion of this scroll to unravel and expose something that is written there. A voice like thunder, verse 1 says, comes from one of the living creatures. It's a very emphatic word. This isn't like one of those rumbles of thunder you hear off in the distance when the storm's approaching. This speaks of one of those thunder cracks that sounds like the whole yard just exploded in the middle of the night. It just bam! And when our kids were little, they'd usually show up in the room freaking out like, what's going on? That's how this living creature's voice sounds. That's how loud and powerful. Come and see! And I looked verse 2 says, and behold, a white horse. So somehow on this scroll displayed pictorially is this scene. Now, if we can go to the IMAX theater and see some man-made movie in 3D and think, wow, that's really cool. I'm sure God has some much more impressive means of displaying his revelations than it's some man-made copy. Now, God chooses to use what may seem to many to be obscure symbolism. He does that for a purpose. He could have said, okay, October 2020 or, uh, you know, 2020 November on such and such a date, a man named so-and-so is going to sign a deal of some sort with the nation Israel. It's going to be in the news. He looks like this. This is the exact place, the exact time, so don't miss this. He could do that. He could be that specific because he's omniscient, but he doesn't do that. He calls people to be students of his word, and it, it, all you would need to do is read Psalm 119 and see 176 verses and proclaim how important the word of God is to know it. But that's just a starter. And through studying his word and bringing things together, I'm going to get a far deeper understanding of who he is, which carries a greater blessing than if he just spoon feeds, you know, information. Just in, just in needing to do that, to study and pull things together, to have to dig in, that separates out those who don't want to know. That just separates the majority of people. It's why Jesus taught in parables. Because he'd teach the whole multitude in parables and then they'd all walk away going, I don't know what that guy's talking about. I really don't care. I got stuff to do. But his disciples would seek him out and they would sit at his feet and receive divine insights. What a blessing that must have been. You look at Mary sitting there right at his feet just soaking it in. Man, Jesus said, this is a place to be. You know, through prophetic scripture, the indwelling Holy Spirit, I get to do the same thing. John sees a white horse, it says in verse 2. And he who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him. Now throughout the Old Testament, Zechariah 10, in, uh, there in Proverbs 21, Job 39, a horse in scripture is described as a weapon of war. And so this scene is connected with warfare, specifically conquest because a white horse is portrayed as an animal ridden in triumph or victory. So the one on this horse is an earthly conqueror, bow and a crown given to him that adds to the symbolism of war and conquest. 
which is verified at the end of verse 2, where it says, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Now we get to chapter 19, we'll see that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, comes back on a white horse out of heaven with a sword and many crowns. What we're seeing here is a lame earthly substitute, but to the world, he's going to be very impressive. A counterfeit Christ, the Antichrist, as he's popularly referred to. The crown here is a Stephanos in Greek. That is a crown that is worn as one in a competition. It is given as a prize put on somebody's head. The crowns on Jesus' head are a different Greek word, diadems. They are royal crowns worn by kings who rule uh, and supremely. Jesus has many of those in his head. Now, in order to get a better understanding, as we're entering into a new portion of Revelation here that is depicting things that are in the future from us, to get a better understanding of this earthly conqueror, turn to the book of Daniel, in chapter 2. Daniel 2. We'll look at several scriptures in Daniel because that's where the most insight into the Antichrist is found. There's a lot of places in the Old Testament that deal with this coming false Christ beginning actually in Genesis chapter 3, the seed of Satan. You walk all the way through Scripture and it's developed. The book of Daniel gives pretty good overview through visions that Daniel received. But the first encounter Daniel has with this prophetic figure and the, the kingdom that he's going to be over is through a dream that King Nebuchadnezzar has. Now, as you know, chapter 2 of Daniel, you can read the bulk of it. We're going to pick up at verse 28. But this Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, had a dream, consisted of his, he, he insisted that his wise men not only interpret the dream, but tell him what the dream was. No one could, so he started killing people. Then Daniel is brought, who tells the king that God gave him the information. It says in verse 28 of Daniel 2, Daniel speaking to King Nebuchadnezzar about his dream. He says, there's a God in heaven who reveals secrets and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. That phrase latter days speaks of the days just prior to the kingdom age. And so when you pull together all of eschatology in the Bible, that would mean right before the second coming of Christ. He's told you what's going to happen, you know, from as we know it, right before the second coming. All they know is the latter days. Your dream and visions in your head and your bed were these. And you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while you were on the bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what it will be. As for me, the secret has not been revealed to me because I'm anyone special. I don't have more wisdom than anyone, but for our sake who make known the interpretation to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your heart. You, O king, were watching and behold a great image, a statue, a, a great image whose splendor was excellent. It stood before you. Its form was awesome. The image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and th thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on the, its feet of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. Then the iron and clay, the bronze, silver, gold were crushed together, became like chaff, from the summer threshing floor and the wind blew it away with no trace of those left. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. That's the dream. We will tell you the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are the king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever children of men dwell or beasts of the field, birds of the, of the heaven, he has given them into your hand, has made you ruler over all. You are the head of gold. 
Nebuchadnezzar had supreme sovereignty over his kingdom. He was somebody who could say, you live, you die, do whatever I tell you to do. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. It won't have one superior leader. This kingdom, the Medo-Persian kingdom, he says, it will rise after you another. The, the metal is less valuable than gold. And then a third kingdom of bronze, even less valuable than that. And a fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, and as much as iron breaks in pieces, shatters everything, and like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Whereas you saw the feet, toes, partly potter's clay, partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, and the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, and the kingdom shall be partly strong, partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron doesn't mix with clay. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, silver, gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come after this. The dream is certain, its interpretation sure. So he's given a dream that is interpreted as, as being a complete overview of all the Gentile kingdoms that are going to come from his time onward. You had the Babylonian kingdom, the Medo-Persian kingdom, the Grecian, and then the Roman kingdom, which was the last of the, these iron legs. The Roman kingdom was never conquered like the previous three. It just split into two. Those are the two legs. You have east and west, and to this day, there's still an east-west dynamic and world geopolitical powers be really between the United States and Russia but that is where the power has always been and what he's saying here is those two powers are going to meld into one into ten really inferior kingdoms that aren't going to get along and when those ten kingdoms of the whole world get come together is when this the Lord is going to set up his kingdom and so turn to chapter 7. Chapter 7, Daniel's given a vision of this, the same thing, basically. Only where the statue was so impressive and, and all these metals of gold and everything, that is how these kingdoms will look from an earthly level. Chapter 7 is given the same series of kingdoms, only how they look from God's perspective, like a bunch of wild animals. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. It's in prophetic scripture, the great sea speaks of all mankind. The, the number four, the like four winds of heaven speaks of north, south, east, and west. This is the whole planet, all of humanity. He said, I saw all of humanity and four great beasts came up from humanity, basically, from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. You ever see the flag or the, the symbol of Babylon? It's a lion that's standing on its hind legs with two wings on it. Now, you know, that is, you know, Babylon, the kingdom that Daniel was in captivity to. The first was like this lion had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off. It was lifted up from the earth, made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart given to it. Suddenly another beast, a second like a bear. It was raised up on one side, had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said, thus arise, devour much flesh. Speaking of the Medo-Persian 
Empire, this bear on one side, the Medo-Persian, one side raised up the Persian side of that empire. The Medes were weaker than the Persians. They were stronger. The three ribs in his mouth is Babylon, the Egyptian Empire, and what was known as the Lydian Empire. All three were conquered, a huge land mass, the largest land mass uh, under one empire in human history, the Medo-Persian Empire. It's pictured as a bear on one side. After this I looked and there was another beast, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. This would be very swift. A leopard's very fast. You put four wings on a leopard and you're going like 100 miles an hour. That's a picture here. This is a picture of the Grecian Empire under Alexander the Great and how they rapidly conquered the earth, conquered the Medo-Persian Empire. The beast had four heads. As soon as Alexander conquered at 30-some years old, he died, and his four generals split the Grecian Empire into four parts. And the dominion was given to these four heads. After this, I saw in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast. So this would be the Roman Empire dreadful, exceedingly uh, strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, trampling residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. It had ten horns. So all of this correlates to the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had in chapter 2. But now additional information is given here. It says in verse 8, I was considering these horns or on this, this fourth beast, there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns, so there's ten horns, verse seven, are these, like the ten toes, these ten world powers that the final one world government is going to be consisting of. He said, among those ten, one rose up, and the picture is that he pushes down three to rise up. A little one coming up among them, verse 8 says, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots, and there in this horn were eyes, eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. The one thing that is indicative of the Antichrist, as you see in these prophetic uh, uh, symbolisms is that he's got a big mouth and he's very blasphemous. I watched till thrones were put in place. So this is where this kingdom that came with like a mountain cut without hands and just destroyed this kingdom at the time when this one ruler is there speaking these pompous words. Thrones were put in place. The Ancient of Days, speaking of the Lord, was seated. His garment was white as snow. Hair on his head was like pure wool, thrown in the fiery flame. It's all picturing the Lord in his glory. He's coming, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands and thousands ministered to him. Ten thousands times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated. The books were opened. So I watched then, because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. It's one, one name for the Antichrist in the Old Testament, the little horn he's called. John, or, or the Daniel says, I'm watching this vision because of this, the words that this pompous horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain, its body destroyed, given to the burning flame, thrown in the lake of fire. As for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I was watching in the night vision, behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. Jesus told the scribes and Pharisees that that's how they will see him when he comes. That's how the world will see him when he returns. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion, glory, kingdom, that all people, nations, languages should serve him, his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. Daniel says in verse 15, I was grieved in my spirit within my body, the visions of my head troubled me. I would imagine it's pretty freaky. I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him, it could be an angel, some you know, some some being there. 
asking the truth of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation. His great beasts are four. There are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. Again, Babylon, Persian, Greece, Greece, and Rome. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom, possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which is different from the others, exceedingly dreadful. Teeth and iron and nails of bronze, which devoured broken pieces, trampled the residue with its feet. The ten horns that were on his head and the other horn which came up before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. Now when Daniel speaks of the saints here in the Old Testament, he knows nothing of the church. So when Daniel talks about the saints, he's speaking of, of the Jews. And he's prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. And he said this fourth beast is going to be a fourth kingdom on earth, which is going to be different from all other kingdoms, shall devour the whole earth. Here's where we understand that this final king, the Roman Empire that split in two, is going to eventuate into a one world government. It's going to be different from the others. It's not just going to be regional, but it's going to eventually take over the whole planet, trample it, break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings who will arise from this kingdom. So there is going to be. 10 maybe economic regions, maybe 10 specific <coughs> rulers who are going to be put in place. We'll see in the book of Revelation when we go back there, the Antichrist gives power to other rulers when he takes over the planet. And so uh, this, this final kingdom is going to take over the whole earth, subdue it, there's going to be ten rulers who shall arise from that kingdom, and that another one is going to rise after them, be different from the ten. He will subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against God. He's going to be a blasphemer and shall persecute the saints of the Most High. He's going to persecute the Jews. And he shall intend to change times and law then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and a half time, three and a half years, the second half of the tribulation period. And it says he shall intend to change times and laws. If there's, a, there's a passage, uh, there's other uh, Old Testament cross-references. One in Isaiah 24 talks about how when God brings this judgment... It says the, in Isaiah 24, 5, the earth is defiled under its inhabitants because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken everlasting covenant. The idea is that he's going to change the way that time is structured on the earth. Many believe it could be that no more B.C., A.D., because everyone knows that's centered around Jesus Christ. He's going to intend to change all these things. And there's going to be, it's going to, power is going to be given into his hand for about three and a half years, but the court shall be seated again. It's a confirmation that God's kingdom is, is going to eventually prevail. It'll take away his dominion, consume, destroy it forever. The kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is everlasting kingdom. All dominion shall serve, obey him. This is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me. My countenance changed. I, was, I kept the matter in my heart. Now, two years later, chapter 8, verse 1, the third year of the reign of King Belteshazzar, the vision he just had was the first year. In the third year of his reign, a vision appeared to me. After the one time appeared to me, the, the first time, I saw in the vision, and so happened. While I was looking, I, I was in Shushan, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam, which is in Iran. And I saw in the vision, I was by the river Uli. Now, the majority of this prophecy deals with the Grecian Empire. It's very interesting historically, and we may get to the book of Daniel unless we get raptured, but 
more information is given in chapter 8 on the Antichrist if you drop down to verse 23. He gives a whole, a whole incredible overview of the Grecian Empire under Alexander the Great in this chapter that just baffles, you know, secular, secularists who want to deny the Bible. But it says here in verse 23, in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall, ar shall arise, having fierce features. So again, the same figure he's developed over and over as you go through the Bible to get to Revelation. We give an incredible picture. But it says here, fierce, fierce features. He's going to have a frightening countenance. He's going to be frightening to look upon. He's going to understand sinister schemes that speaks of literally dark sentences. So he's going to use occultic means to... Second uh, Thessalonians speaks of how he's going to be granted demonic or satanic power. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power, verse 24 says. It's going to be satanic, supernatural. He's going to be able to call fire down from the sky, it says in 2 Thessalonians. You put someone like that on the earth, walking around, who calls down fire from the sky, I guarantee you people are going to follow that person if they do not know this book. Someone's with that kind of power, God's going to allow them to have it. It says in 2 Thessalonians 2, God's going to give them strong delusion. You don't want to believe the truth? Here, have a leader who's going to have full-on satanic power. He's going to allow him to have that power for, two, for three and a half years. Think of what happened just in six months. Imagine the state that the world is going to be in under someone like that. It says in verse 24, he shall destroy fearfully, he shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. Again, Israel, through his cunning, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule. Do you think their fake news is rampant now? And he shall exalt himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. It says, he shall even rise against the prince of princes, speaking again of the Messiah, the true Christ. This is where the idea, he will be anti-Christ. But he's going to be broken, but not with human, without human means. We'll see that when we get to chapter 19, Revelation. Now turn to chapter 9 of Daniel. It's not too far, it's probably on the same page. Yeah, wow, how convenient is that? It says there, in the first year of Darius, son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. This is in the first year of a Persian king who took over the Babylonian, the that's what the Chaldeans are. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of years spe specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet. So in other words, Daniel was doing what we're doing right here. He was studying Bible prophecy, specifically Jeremiah the prophet. Studying it, looking, God, what are you saying here? What are you trying to tell me? I understood by the books, it's plural, so there's more than just Jeremiah. He was studying other passages of scripture prophetic scripture and un understood by these, specifically Jeremiah 29, Jeremiah 25, that God was going to accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. They are in captivity and he understood by reading Jeremiah this captivity is going to last for 70 years. And he's r right at the end of the 70 years. And so he comes to the understanding this, through studying Bible prophecy, and he says in verse 3, So I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And so the, the 70 years is almost over for the desolations that has come upon Jerusalem, he says in verse 2. And as he's praying, he prays specifically, verse 17, 
So now this is his prayer request. Now therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications. And for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, speaking of the temple, which is desolate. O oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations. And the city, which is called by your name, Jerusalem, just in complete uh, rubble. He said, we don't present our supplication because you, because of our righteous deeds, obviously. We do it because of your great mercies, the great way to pray. Oh Lord, hear. Oh Lord, forgive. Oh Lord, listen, act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, in your city, Jerusalem, the people called by your name. As an answer to this request that Daniel is given this prophetic timetable here in Daniel chapter 9, one of the most important prophecies, if not the most, in the Old Testament. He asked God to look upon Jerusalem's desolations there in verses 17 and 18, to which he's given a prophecy that tells exactly how how long desolations upon Jerusalem will last? As you see at the end of verse 26, it says, till the end of war, this is how long desolations are determined. So this is what the answer he's giving, because he's asking God, please bring an end to the desolation that has taken over Jerusalem. And he's, gonna, he's given a specific timetable of when those desolations will end and the Lord's kingdom will be set up. So verses 20 through 23 explain how this message came by way of an angelic messenger. And then in, it says, that while I was speaking, verse 21, in prayer, Gabriel, an angel, whom I'd seen in a vision, was caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering, informed me, talked to me, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill of understanding. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and have come, I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved, therefore consider the matter and understand the vision. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and your holy city to finish transgression to end sin, reconciliation of iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up vision, prophecy, and anoint the most holy or the Messiah. So Daniel, not having, knowing anything of the church age, he's assuming, you know, the Babylonian captivity, the 70-year captivity is going to be sufficient punishment to fulfill God's plan through Israel here on earth. He's given a prophetic correction here. It's not 70 years, Daniel, 70 weeks, he says. 77 year periods. That word, it's literally sevens in Hebrew. 77s, it's a word that speaks of seven of anything. The, the way we would use a dozen, it's that kind of a term where you say, you know, bring me a dozen, you know, of those, uh, of, you know, bread, loaves of bread. You, you know you want 12 of them. A dozen is 12. This word is the same type of idiom, but it means seven of something. Daniel thought 70 years in Babylonian captivity would be sufficient. He's told not 70 years, 70 seven-year periods are going to be necessary, Daniel. For all these things to take place, for the, all prophecy to be, to be summed up, to seal all vision and prophecy and make an end of sin and for the Messiah's kingdom to be set up. Speaking of all these things that will be accomplished when the Lord returns, as we'll see in Revelation 19, things that we know, you know, I mean, this is a complete mystery even to Daniel when he got this. We've got the privilege of knowing ahead of time a lot more information. All Daniel was given was this prophecy here. He says in verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. So he is in, he's in Persia waiting for the 70 year captivity to end so they can go back and rebuild. From the time that the command is given, that command for Jerusalem to be rebuilt is recorded in Nehemiah chapter 2. 
You see the whole book of Nehemiah deals with him going back to rebuild the city from that command to go rebuild the city of Jerusalem until the Messiah comes. So it'll be seven weeks, 62 weeks. So you kind of need like a calculator to do this Bible study. The street shall be rebuilt again, the wall even in troublesome times. It's going to be seven seven-year periods followed by an additional 62 seven-year periods. The first seven seven-year period, 49 years, is referring to the build, rebuilding time that took place under Nehemiah. The street, the wall, verse 25 said, will be rebuilt in troublesome times. All you got to do is read Nehemiah and see while they're building, they have to have a sword in one hand and they're building bricks on it. This is all speaking ahead of time. He's saying there's going to be 49 years of rebuilding the city that is going to be just a hard time to build in. But after that, there's going to be 62 sevens or 62 seven-year periods, 434 years, which you add that to the seven before. You got 483 years total or 173,880 days exactly until verse 25 says the Messiah comes. So according to this, if you took, which is, there's the, the date, March 14th, 445 BC is when the command was given, you go rebuild Jerusalem. If you started counting down from that day, 173,880, 173,879, 173,878, all the way 10, 9, 8, 7, 8, whatever, however it is, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Yeah, liftoff. If you were standing there at Jerusalem, you would see a rabbi from Galilee riding in on a donkey on the exact day that this said the Messiah came he did exactly to the day he rode into the city on a donkey like Zechariah said he would and what we know is Palm Sunday it's recorded in all four Gospels you read the account in Luke it says Jesus broke down and wept he, the word is he, he wept violently Sob, he said, if you would have known the day of your visitation, the day that I he gave the exact day, it says right here, the exact day that the Messiah would come. They didn't even know. They were too busy making money and doing things in the temple. You know how many people aren't even aware of the dates we're living in? We got more information for when the second coming is. We're not even given the, second, the exact day. They were given the exact day when he would come. But look what it says after 62 weeks. He will be cut off. He will be killed. The Messiah will be killed, but not for himself. He was killed for you and me. And what incredible prophecy. You think people would be waiting there. They weren't. So Jesus prophesied their destruction. He said the city is going to be completely destroyed. And it's not going to be a 70-year punishment. They have been sent into captivity for 2,000 years. What, you know, think of what an amazing prophecy this is. After 69 seven-year periods, the Messiah came as promised. And so at 69, the whole thing began. At Daniel, it's not going to be 70 years. It's going to be 77-year time period. 69 of them ended when Jesus came to Jerusalem. There's one seven-year time period left. It's called the 70th week of Daniel. That is what the whole book of Revelation is based upon. That's what, that's what it shows. What, that's what this final week, as it is called here, what takes place during that time. It says that he's the Messiah, verse 26, is going to be killed, not for himself. But then it says, And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end of it shall be with a flood, and until the end of the war, desolations are determined. And he... Speaking of the prince, the, the prince who is to come from verse 26, he will confirm a covenant with many for one week. In this prophecy, that's seven years. 
in the middle of the week, three and a half years, he is going to bring an end to sacrifice and offering on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolation even to the consummations determined. We will examine all of that when we get to the middle of the tribulation period. But we take time to go over this because it, this is the basis, like I said, for chapters 6 through 18 of the book of Revelation. Jesus Christ... Of course, he was cut off and killed, not for himself, crucified. When it says there, you know, at the end of verse 26, the people of the prince who are to come, that's speaking of the Romans. Rome, totally unknown to Daniel when this prophecy was given. He just he given this vision, write this down, Daniel, it's not even for you. The people of the prince who will come are going to destroy the city and the sanctuary. That happened under General Titus, a Roman general, who destroyed the temple in 70 AD. Jesus prophesied it, but all Jesus was doing was saying what, what was going to happen according to Daniel chapter 9. The people of the prince, the Romans. So the... And it's, notice it's the people of the prince who come. The Romans are insignificant. It's the one who's going to come to usher in the final 70th week, who's the significant person in this prophecy. He's the one. It's just the, you know, the prince of the people who will come. Jerusalem was destroyed, as it says in verse 26, along with the temple, the sanctuary, and it's been nothing but wars since, as it said, the end shall come with a flood till the end war desolations are determined. That's all it's been in that area of the world until it says here, he shall confirm a covenant, speaking of the prince who is to come, will, de will fulfill a covenant. This is where many believe the Antichrist has ties to Europe. Because if, if, the, if it was the Romans, you know, and the prince came from that people, then he's not Chinese, he's not, you know, a Peruvian, he obviously comes from Rome around that area. Many believe Europe. That could very well be, but the most significant thing here is his confirming, as it says, this covenant. That word confirm speaks of some type of contract or an agreement with Israel. It says, with the many, verse 27, there's an article before that word many in Hebrew that makes this speak of a specific group of Israelis who have the authority to bind all of Israel to this agreement. It is this agreement that verse 27 says begins the final year tribulation period. When that is signed, that is where all hell is going to break loose on this earth. It is an agreement, it says here, the Antichrist is going to break in the middle of the seven-year contract, which we'll look at in detail again. There's going to be a couple chapters on the middle of the tribulation period. But first, one more passage, chapter 11, and we'll go get to Revelation and just see a few verses there. Chapter 11 of Daniel. Like I said, you can go through this. This is where most of the information is given on the Antichrist. We will be with the Lord worshiping him. Perhaps a CD like this or if any other Bible teacher will be around so people can go, wow, what's going on after the church is gone? Because this, this chapter gives more insight into this man's character. In the midst of an extended prophecy, it takes two chapters here. We're just going to look at the part that describes the Antichrist in verse 36. It's speaking again of the Antichrist, and I would encourage you to go back and do your homework. But it says, Then the king shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god. So again, very prideful, very arrogant shall speak blasphemies against the God of God, so against the true God. He shall prosper till wrath has been accomplished for what has been determined shall be done. So he's going to act of his own will. He's going to be exalting himself, making himself superior to all people, and to the point of deifying himself, saying he is a God. 
he will he shall regard neither the God of his fathers literally it's a little G Elohim God's there verse 37 he will not regard the gods of his fathers nor the desire of women nor regard any God for he shall exalt himself above them so he's either going to be an atheist or he's just going to be so full of himself he believes he's God he's not going to desire women could be he's homosexual it doesn't say but you know it's not going he's going to be unnatural in that category it says in verse 38 in the play in their play instead of all of that he's going to be so bent on power in taking over world power, a god of he shall honor a god of fortresses. Speaks of of warfare, a god which his fathers didn't know. He shall honor with gold, silver, precious stones, and pleasant things. Very powerful, very rich. And then verse thirty nine says he shall act against the strongest fortresses with a foreign god. In other words, under satanic power, through satanic power, unnatural human characteristics. He's going to conquer the strongest fortresses on the planet, and here it says, "He will, and he, which he will acknowledge and advance its glory. He shall cause them to rule over many and divide the land for gain." In other words, he's going to conquer all all fortresses, the strongest fortresses on earth. He's going to divide up the rule among lesser rulers, and do it all for power. So this is a brief or pretty long, actually, overview of the one that we see. As you turn back to Revelation 6 now, this is the one who comes riding out on this horse in Revelation chapter 6. Now, who this Antichrist figure is, we don't know. But he could be on the earth at this point. He could be walking around on world power today because you think about it. When you put all these things together, and you go back and pull it together, you know, I'm just trying to give an overview. But if you think about what you read here and the information given here, in order for him, for this final seven year period, this final week of Daniel's to be set in motion, you need several things to be in place and multiple things that you didn't have in place even 70 years ago. First, you need a nation of Israel. That's a big time marker because he's going to make a covenant and a contract with Israel. That happened in 1948, but then you're going to need Israel to have a control of Jerusalem. That didn't happen until 1967. Then you're going to have to have a temple, the sanctuary, that he is going to, he is going to destroy in the middle of the tribulation period. We'll see more of that. That's it. So you got Israel, you got Jerusalem, and you got a whole temple institute with everything ready to build a temple the minute they get the real estate, it's going to go up instantly. I've been in the place twice. And if you watch the news at all the feast days, they have the priests. They have the building itself fabricated out. All they got to do is construct it, and it's up and ready to roll. All function, you need all of that functioning, but to coincide with all of that, you also need Israel to be in a position globally to where some contract or agreement they sign with someone would trigger all these world events. Nations make contracts and treaties every single day. But whatever the agreement is that Daniel talks about, that the Antichrist signs with Israel, it's going to trigger, trigger not only world affairs with him at the lead as he rides out here on this white horse, but it is going to trigger God's wrath coming upon this earth like never seen before. Like worldwide Sodom and Gomorrah, a cataclysmic time is going to be triggered at that moment when that contract is signed that is going to be equal to the flood of Noah. You put all of this together, you pick up back in Revelation 6, the signing of that covenant spoken of in Daniel 9, 
obviously is going to give this world leader unprecedented authority. Because verse 2 says, he goes forth conquering and to conquer. That's just the first seal. He goes forth and he conquers to conquer. Verse 3 says, when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. So no sooner is the, that covenant with Israel signed than the worst period of world war breaks out. Each of the four living creatures here is given a chance to show the Apostle John what takes place as the series of seals are opened. The second seal unleashes a fiery red horse. You notice verse 4 says, It was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth. That's where most people believe that the Antichrist ushers in this brief period of peace. Could be a year or two of great peace on the earth. You've got to have peace for it to be taken away. And so whenever he goes out, he conquers on this white horse. And very well could be, like I said, you know, you see how quickly world events take place just in six months. And this guy conquering, and there's going to be world peace, and everyone's going to be exalting him as the savior of this world. It says, another fiery horse, red, comes on. Red is a color symbolic of bloodshed and carnage, so a major outbreak of violence. Yeah, I read today in the news, in 2019, more people were killed by fists and hands than rifles in 2019. Or people just killed by just people going crazy. <laughs> but here, people killing one another, verse 4, a great sword, again, all symbolic of mass slaughter. Then verse 5 says, when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come and see. So I looked and behold a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for denarius, three quarts of barley for denarius, do not harm the oil in the wine. So black in scripture is symbolic of mourning. It's symbolic of evil, of distress. So it began as peace upon the earth. The Antichrist hailed as the world's savior. Unfortunately, things just turned from bad to worse. The first rider had a bow. The second rider had a sword. This third rider has a scale in his hands. And this voice is heard coming from the throne, a quart of wheat for denarius, three quarts of barley. The picture is of food being carefully rationed. Just the bare minimum needed to survive a quart of wheat will cost a day's wage, is what a denarius is. They work a whole day just to get enough food to, to live on. And those who are really poor, who can only have access for barley, that's like cheaper grain, three quarts of that for the same price as a quart of wheat. So the picture is of worldwide famine following a period of unprecedented violence. Do not harm the oil and the wine, it says. That's picturing a situation where the extremely wealthy are not affected. They remain wealthy in power while the poor are barely scraping by. And through a massive administration of food rationing, what we would know as worldwide socialism will take over the whole planet. It's going to be a whole upper echelon of wealthy people who are going to be wine and oil, everything they need, and the rest of the world is going to be starving to death. All of which leads to verse 7. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And the name of him who sat on it was death, and hell followed with him. And power was given to him over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, hunger, death, and beasts of the earth. Pale is a word that means literally livid. It speaks of the color of a corpse. 
There's no description of the rider here. You notice like the first three, just the name, death and hell following after this horse. And so in other words, death through natural means is what is conquering the earth at that point. No need violence anymore. People are just dying of natural means. Through violence, the sword, starvation, as in famine, disease called death, and wild animals. Power is given to death by those means and all that has come before this, the violence and everything else as well, all that has come before to kill one-fourth of the world's population. Right now the world is almost at 8 billion people. So that means just in the opening of these seals, two billion people are going to be killed right at the beginning of the seven-year tribulation period. Now, I hate to leave on such an upbeat note like this, but that's where we're leaving off because when he opens the fifth seal, he opens a whole new topic that we're going to have to develop next time. Lord, thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you, God, that, uh, Lord, you're not keeping anyone in the dark. You're so merciful, God, and you've opened this up over, over the whole period of time on this earth. Lord, we see that your word is miraculous. And so, God, I pray as we see the things taking place on the earth, this so worldwide socialism doesn't seem to be too obscure at this point. <laughs> Seems like everybody's pushing for and God, we got an election in about three weeks or so that could change the course of events on this planet instantly. And either way, God, it is going to change things because people aren't just going to close up shop and go home. Even if our present leader, God, we realize even if he wins, God, there's going to be incredible hell to pay. It just it's the writings on the wall. We pray it doesn't, God. We pray there'd be great revival, Lord. I pray every day, God, that you would bring the gospel, that we would read this and see how urgent the days are we live in, God. And Lord, to keep uh, the technology working here that we can get the word out. This went out tonight, Lord. Other things have gone out. We every day we're sending out Bible studies over a, multi, a large area, God. May they be heard. May they bring forth the fruit, God. May they open people's eyes. We could care less, at least I could, Lord, of some kind of notoriety or anything else, God. We just want to get your word out because the hour is so late. We want to call out to as many people as we possibly can, God, whether it's personally talking to someone on the street or whether, God, it is broadcasting over the radio, over the internet, whatever it is, Lord. Please, God, just use us in that way. And Lord, if these things are transpiring, then obviously the rapture is even more imminent. So maybe be watching and waiting, Lord, as you called us to do. We praise and love you, Jesus. In your name, amen. All right.